without the mic, in this room, I should be audible. Uh, anyway, uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I welcome to my support demo. Uh, uh, I hope for everyone, the uh, information is over from yesterday's real event. Or uh, if not, uh, they are at least, uh, you know, at this, uh, what is it called? Uh, the Vano Peak. <laughs> oh, it's not visible. Or a lot of other things for logging uh, 
And uh, as you can see, some of these have been turned into plugins into later uh, later container systems such as uh, Docker. Uh, and that actually helps uh, when you are uh, deploying something such as these with the orchestrators such as Kubernetes. And as I said, the agnosticity is also very important. And when I say agnosticity, I don't just mean the uh, uh, the location agnosticity, but also in terms of uh, the API. Uh, when you are talking about these components, uh, you should be able to view them uh, effortlessly, and uh, uh, and you should be able to do it. Uh, they should be like a very uh, loosely defined API so that uh, you can replace them or you can add more of them or compose them. Uh, anyway, uh, so for, for, for the kind of architecture I'm talking about for the Kubernetes, uh, the one at least that is defined uh, on the Kubernetes side for as a, like reference architectures are some of them including like client server based that you have like a bunch of clients uh, and then a server. Uh, uh, multiple nodes uh, in a server, of course, uh, or a multi-layered one, you know, which is more common in organizations where you have clients, then several uh, first level of the, the servers on the edge, then the mid-level uh, uh, web servers, then the database servers. So that, that's the kind of uh, uh, architecture that is uh, intended for use by Kubernetes. Uh, next thing is uh, the scaling. Uh, so as you may know, there are two kinds of scaling. You scale either horizontally or you scale vertically. But which one is more preferred? I, uh, well, I may be kind of biased towards this, but I believe that uh, the approach is more towards uh, horizontal scalability than a vertical scalability because uh, scaling vertically uh, implies that uh, implies that you do not scale the service, but you scale the uh, one of the nodes of the service. And and I, I don't believe it can be done as uh, Elastically as possible, as our intended. Uh, the next thing I'm going to uh, next thing is the statelessness in databases, and this is uh, very important because when you're using a, uh, when you're using a service pass service, uh, you you generally require uh, uh, the planes, the control and the data plane to be separate. And uh, and what I mean by this is you should be able to change them. Uh, you should be able to change them without uh, impacting the other planes. And uh, I see this is uh, being implemented in something such as MySQL cluster. If you used uh, MySQL cluster, you can see that they have like, uh, the storage plane is separated from the control plane. That's a good example of that. And uh, I believe Google Vitex also has something like that. <coughs> okay, uh, next thing is, uh, I'm talking about elastic scalability. Uh, what I mean by that is, uh, and this is, when people generally talk of scalability, they they talk of scaling, you know, upwards, you know, adding more nodes. And but what they do not, uh, what most of the scalability discussions do not talk about is scaling down. You know, scaling down and scaling up uh, has scaling down is something that has its own challenges in most of the and it's kind of the weak point in many of the uh, you know architectures. And I think that so the scalability also needs to be elastic. And uh, the, the reason uh, I stress on this is because if, if it's not elastic, people are general, there will be a general uh, impedance towards scaling upwards because many times, because the traffic in the, in, in, you know, on the web, uh, it can be a spiky one. You know, you may have like a spiky traffic just on the weekend. And you know, during the weekdays, you may not have it more. So uh, having a kind of, and maybe this is not on all weekends, maybe only during holidays, stuff like that. So you should be able to scale up and down uh, quite elastically. Uh, the next thing I just want to talk about is uh, declarative versus imperative, and this is also very important, I believe. And this is uh, something that has been there for a while uh, in you know configuration on configuration management systems, in, you know, Puppet, Ansible, uh, on Terraform, and whatnot. Uh, and I think this is important because uh, it helps you to compose uh, your microservices better. And this is very important because uh, as developers, we develop, you know, like such as, uh, for instance, if you develop like a Python service, initially you run it inside your virtual env and then, you know, you try to uh, uh, scale it uh, upwards. That is, first you run as in, in an application level uh, isolation and then you try to run it in a operating system level isolation and, you know, uh, that way, so uh, you try to <coughs> move it. And that's very important uh, when you are using, uh, and that's very important when you're using the declarative uh, paradigm rather than imperative one, because with the declarative one, and this is something I found in a, uh, uh, somewhere in 
and some other slide, and uh, it, say, it says that you need the immutable, immutability is very important there. That is, what, you, what runs on my laptop, it should be, it should, it should be equally reproducible and uh, identically, not identically, but equally uh, uh, reproducible on server, and uh, that's very important, I believe. And uh, I think some of the principles are also summarized uh, in the 12-factor app, uh, uh, which uh, I believe was put forward by the engineers from Heroku or someone. And uh, that they also quite, uh, stress the uh, composability uh, factor a lot there. And uh, this, this this Lego blocks uh, I was trying to illustrate the principle of composability. Okay, so uh, this is uh, just a slide about containers. I believe, uh, I guess, uh, by I mean, it has been uh, there in our uh, tech space for so long. It may have become cliche now. Uh, anyway, I'll just mention it anyways. Uh, so what's a container and why should I care? So uh, this is, you know, just to mention in three words, it's just operating system virtualization as opposed to your uh, para virtualization or full-scale virtualization in like Xen or KVM. Uh, so again, what's the core? What lies at the core of a container is mainly isolation. And as I said, uh, there are several hierarchies of isolation, as I would like to put it. Uh, when you, uh, when you have something like an application level isolation, you are running it inside a, a sandbox, uh, an application level sandbox. Uh, then uh, you'd like to scale it to a container which uses you know, C groups and namespaces, namespaces being something such as PID network or mount namespaces so that uh, there is a sufficient level of isolation. And then you have like SACOM for uh, filtering the use calls. And uh, yeah, uh, the namespaces is what I wanted to concentrate on. Uh, and uh, the next thing is there are you know uh, the latest uh, unikernels have been there for a while uh, and they and they have been in the news recently as well. Anyway, uh, so unikernels and VMs, uh, what is their role? You know, and uh, I would like to mention that you know while people are talking excessively about containers, uh, it's also important to consider uh, the role of VMs because uh, the unit of uh, 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 unit of processing, what I've seen, goes like it goes like. It, it doesn't have to be bare metal is what I'm saying. It can be like a bare metal VM and container because for several reasons, uh, uh, so many deployments require isolation which may not be met by a container. You need, you may require a, a much higher level of isolation. So, you know, the VM is a second, VM is a second level uh, and above the bare metal. Anyway, uh, some of the contemporary container solutions are like LXE, which has been there for a while and which is uh, very mature as well, I believe. Uh, of course, Docker, uh, then Rocket, uh, RunC, which, has, which is the unified kind of thing, and then you have Gales in other operating systems, uh, Solar, you can do Zone, and, and let me contain that for you from Google, which uh, I'm not sure is open source yet, which actually they use instead of Kubernetes internally, it seems. Uh, and then you have like SystemD and Spawn, which, anyway. Uh, so this is like a really, really short intro to Galera cluster. Uh, I believe there's a talk from uh, Fred late in the evening at six uh, on demystification of Galera. Uh, so this is basically a MySQL. Uh, every node in a Galera is MySQL, uh, inodb specifically, and uh, it, it implements what you call as a right side replication API. And uh, you have like a Galera plugin which implements the API, which acts, uh, which actually implements the logic of uh, group communication and synchronous replication. And uh, I mentioned it as a virtually synchronous replication because uh, only, is, uh, only the parts which are necessary to implement ordering and reliability are the synchronous ones. But uh, the, for optimization purposes, the parts that do not require you to have a, a, the the reliability or the performance are, are not synchro fully synchronous. Anyway, uh, I, would, I, would, I would still defer to the talk from uh, right on, on demystification of that. Anyway, uh, and this is uh, most of it's most of uh, mostly a certification based uh, concurrency. And uh, what that means is uh, when you have like a conflict, you use optimistic concurrency uh, uh, and uh, pessimistic uh, concurrency. <coughs> The latter being where you use like blocks, uh, which are uh, which do not scale or a distributed system anyway. Uh, yeah, so this is its uh, this is how the layer looks and like the DBMS is INODB here and you know you have all these things. Yeah, as I said, it's a synchronous application, and uh, I believe there was a talk earlier today from uh, Diego on uh, group communication, 
I SQL group replication, which are also uh, which is which may not have the same architecture, but which implements the same principles. And I believe it is reduced corrosive uh, earlier. Anyway, uh, so uh, what's next? So what I'm going to mention here is why, why yeah, how does this fit? You know, normally uh, when uh, when people talk about uh, 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 you know implementing databases on uh, such uh, systems, uh, they they mention that it needs to be stateless, you know, so that you can uh, easily move around. Because data is is a huge uh, factor, and moving data around is not that simple. So either they talk about stateless uh, databases or the ones which uh, which have like separate planes of uh, uh, control and data, so that you can move control uh, planes uh, easily and uh, keep the data you know, wherever it is. Uh, so what? Uh, yeah. So. Uh, yeah, as I said here, yeah, MySQLcos is one of them. And why, how does uh, Galera fit here? Is because it's, as I said, it's a synchronous replication, and and with that, uh, since it also has like an automatic uh, node provisioning, all the nodes are symmetric. The symmetricity is what uh, helps here, and uh, that's what uh, ensures the item potency when you are provisioning the cluster. So that is, you can use like a template, and you can provision all the nodes of the cluster, uh, which helps with something such as replication controllers of Kubernetes. And uh, for someone who is wondering here whether what kind of uh, you know cap, uh, what subset of cap deployments is basically a CPU system. That is, if you have like a partition, there will be a one partition which is a primary component which will be available always, but the other partition which will only support something such as something like a dirty read. Uh, anyway, uh, so yeah, okay. Now coming uh, to the main gist of the talk. Okay, what is orchestration? And there are some really. Uh, 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 definitions of uh, uh, service oriented architecture definitions of orchestration we talk of stitching or composing uh, 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 diverse services and, uh, and there is something uh, something like choreography there is it seems, actually when I was doing some research on these terms I came across uh, the concept of choreography of services uh, which seemed a bit uh, 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 you know uh, facetious but again uh, uh, but it, what it implies is it implies that uh, the concept that I mentioned earlier, where you use like uh, many reusable components such as logging or DNS, and you try to uh, have them in the, and you try to use them uh, as like one service. That is, uh, the sum being uh, uh, greater than uh, the total, you know, something like that. And you define the protocol in which they can. You, can, you either define the protocol or or uh, you uh, make the services aware, or actually on the other side, uh, agnostic of the protocol. Uh, okay, so coming to uh, Kubernetes itself. Uh, so, the, so these are the main uh, constituents, but not the the ones that are applicable here. You basically have something uh, called Kubelet, which runs on every node, and which implements uh, the Kubernetes on every worker node. This is not the master node. There is a master node which implements uh, Stuff like scheduling and all that, but I'm talking about the worker node. And you have like something like pod, in which you like a pod is basically a collection of containers, logically logical collection of containers which uh, share the same network namespace. And and I, I believe they can also share volumes because uh, that's how the pods are uh, uh, scheduled. That they are scheduled on the same physical uh, node, physical node or physical VM. Sorry, on a VM or physical node. So uh, in a pod, you can have like a main service such as like a MySQL D running and any of the associated auxiliary helpers for it. And uh, there's a concept of services uh, in Kubernetes, which is basically an endpoint with which clients can access the ser servers of, or in case of Galera itself, the, the servers can talk to each other uh, independent of the physical addresses of the uh, other nodes. And this is very important because uh, in a dynamic situation where servers come and go, uh, the knowledge of their physical addresses, uh, physical IP addresses, uh, is less important. And having an endpoint which is which ensures that uh, that the quorum of the cluster is maintained is more important. And then you have something called replication controller, which basically what it ensures is uh, if you if you are familiar with the concept of uh, auto scaling uh, uh, in AWS or something like that, you, uh, this uh, is something similar to it. That is, it ensures that you have like a single you can you can say that you want uh, three nodes in a cluster, and if one of the node crashes uh, due to a bug or you know something else, this 
ensures that another uh, node is provisioned. When I say node, I don't mean the physical node, but a uh, node in the cluster, a uh, node in the Galera cluster, a virtual node, yeah, just to put it that way. Uh, so it ensures that the minimal, uh, uh, so that uh, the minimal number of replicas remain. Uh, then you have to the concept of labels and selectors. Basically, uh, what you can do is you can attach metadata to every node in terms of uh, the name and the service uh, and all that. And you can use selectors to uh, to uh, uniquely identify uh, any subset of nodes. And this is kind of uh, familiar to uh, us uh, from Puppet, like uh, Puppet uh, types, uh, using M selective to uh, uniquely identify a subset of nodes, something, something similar to that. Uh, yeah, so this is this is the basic uh, architecture or how it is. Uh, so in case of Galera, so this is uh, uh, how each uh, container will look. So the each uh, Galera node will be running inside each of these pods. And uh, C advisor is basically uh, uh, used uh, to collect uh, uh, metrics and stuff like that. Uh, and it's not unique to Kubernetes. It's, it's uh, but it has been uh, used mostly in Kubernetes, I believe. And this proxy is what is used to implement a service endpoint. And this is uh, the actual master node. And uh, yeah, I'll come to each of these things uh, soon. So this is how it looks, basically. Uh, so I just wanted to mention other thing, uh, others which are uh, used similar to Kubernetes, uh, some things such as uh, fleet or grid methods, you have those things. Uh, Anyway, so what is a pod? You know, uh, pod is basically uh, you know a collection of, uh, as I said, a collection of uh, related uh, uh, containers. So it's like a pod in an office, you know, where you are the main guy, and you know there are other things uh, uh, in, in your pod which are which help you with stuff, or, or your laptop, for instance. Uh, anyway, so so what do, what do they contain? The containers are. And uh, how, is, how is the grouping done? Uh, the grouping is, uh, the lo as I said, it's not a physical grouping. You cannot like physically uh, group the containers in any way like that. It's more of a logical grouping. So that they are co-located on the same node, so that they share the same network namespace. And when I say network namespace, what I mean by that is, suppose a, a associated service were to refer the main service, it can directly refer to to local host and the port combination rather than an IP address and a port combination which is very helpful when you're running something such as a health check uh, as a separate service, for instance, or a HA proxy, for instance, if you're running <coughs> along with the Galera uh, node itself, then, you know, that, that is very useful as well. That's very useful. And uh, port communication is something I'll refer later. And yes, you can attach a label to a uh, port so that you can refer to them. Uh, and this is very useful when you're uh, trying to use a client to uh, either bring them up or down for various things. Uh, so this is how a service looks. So you have like, uh, in case of a Galera, or a Galera cluster or some XDB cluster, these all these pods contain the, well, each of the MySQL disks running inside them and uh, they expose, uh, in that case, the three ports and uh, you know, a client can access. And what additional benefit is provided by the service endpoint is it also provides you a load balancing, which, is, which can also be very useful. Uh, anyway, so this, uh, I just wanted to mention that you shouldn't commingle it with the microservices because this, uh, the, the term services has been, it's, it, it's not been used uh, uh, as a synonym for, uh, uh, my, uh, as a synonym for uh, microservice, but it's more, more of an endpoint here. So think, of, think more of an endpoint uh, with which you can refer to other nodes or clients or uh, another layer of uh, your uh, architecture. <coughs> okay, anyway, so how is the communication, uh, okay, what is the purpose of a service? That's more important. And I believe it's, uh, it's, a, it's for the communication, uh, I, at least in this case, I'm using it for the communication between the nodes, because when the nodes dynamically emerge or die, uh, you do not want the, uh, the cluster to go down, but, uh, but the endpoint to still remain up based on the other nodes in the cluster. And that, and uh, a service abstraction is what helps in that. So that when you refer to this, and I'll tell you what uh, uh, this, I'll uh, show you the how the abstraction is done. And uh, this communication of the service happens to each node through either uh, environment variables like how you have it with Docker, uh, 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 environment variables which are exported and available inside the container. Uh, 
but uh, having this environment variables imposes an ordering requirement, uh, which means that uh, you need the service to be up before the loads, before the load is up. Otherwise, uh, that's uh, you know that can be a problem. But it's much easier with the discovery. Uh, with the DNS, the problem is uh, there are several issues with DNS and something that has been solved with the better discovery mechanisms such as smart stack. But smart stack is not available in Kubernetes, so it's either, one, either of two, these two things. So the problem with DNS is <coughs> the, uh, the problem with TTLs or the problem with the clients which uh, do not, uh, or the libraries which uh, implement DNS in, uh, in different ways which can uh, uh, introduce significant issues with your architecture, with your, with your SOA architecture. And so replication container, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it uses basically a template and it ensures that a minimal number of nodes are up. Uh, it's more lo more of an init for a cluster, but it, it can also be used for like rolling updates or multiple versions. Suppose you want to run like multiple versions of a, uh, if you want to run a Galera cluster with a subset of nodes on a higher version, but with uh, uh, but with the communication compatibility, uh, you can do that with this. You can say that, and you can assign node. Uh, replication controller doesn't have to be one. You can run multiple uh, replication controllers. Uh, with each uh, managing a subset of nodes. So it's more of like a herd management in terms of the uh, analogy I mentioned earlier of pets and cattles. Uh, and this is, uh, next thing is networking. Network is very important in Kubernetes, at least to, uh, not for uh, the users, but for the people who uh, uh, try to ha uh, have Kubernetes of their own, rather than on a GCE or uh, Tectonic or anything. Uh, so th the way it works is instead of, uh, so there are three kinds of actually three, but I'll just want you to one more. Communication which uh, requires uh, port to port and port to service and intra port and external to service. When I say external to service, it means uh, from, uh, from a client, from an external client which is outside uh, your uh, architecture. Uh, and intra port being, as I said, uh, uh, from like an HA proxy which is running uh, alongside your, inside the port itself. So you can refer to it as local host. Port to port being the, between the nodes of the cluster and port to service. In this case, the port to service and port to port are kind of uh, overlapping because the service endpoint in turn is not a, another client but the server itself because this is a, a symmetric cluster, right? And uh, to ensure uh, this kind of networking, you can use uh, uh, these things with uh, Kubernetes, but the uh, one on GCE uses Google Compute Engine, the one on uh, Tectonic, I, uh, I believe, uses Flannel, but there are others such as uh, Open vSwitch and Calico, I believe. Uh, as I said, this uh, linking is not the Docker style of linking. Uh, when I say Docker style linking, it, uh, the one that we had uh, since the inception, uh, where you know you link the container and it, uh, it gets uh, its uh, etc host updated with the new container. That's not how uh, the linking works, and that that's kind of an anti pattern here because, uh, as I said, for a cluster. Uh, it's uh, more dynamic and uh, uh, you don't uh, want such, you, you want the newer nodes to be uh, known to the older ones and vice versa. Uh, anyway, so these are the external components which are there. Uh, as I said, the earlier components are the ones that run with the services. So these are the external components. Uh, of course, you have like a container registry which uh, in some cases is QA or in case of Google, there's a Google container registry. You have the scheduler, which I believe also is pluggable now. I believe, uh, there was a talk just a uh, uh, few, uh, I believe one hour back from Kubernetes uh, on how to write custom schedulers and use metrics to auto scale your uh, cluster. Of course, it provides a REST server and C advisor and Fluentd. Uh, Fluentd is used for logging uh, uh, in some other places, but in, on Google Compute Engine, it uses Google logging, so some kind of Google logging. Uh, yeah, then you have HCD for ensuring the for management of, for control management, so something like Zookeeper. Uh, anyway, so this is another example I just wanted to mention of, uh, I would say that this is uh, something that we have uh, uh, in-house at uh, Yelp and which was also recently open source. And uh, this is more of a, uh, le less of an orchestrator and more of a choreographer uh, is uh, how, would I, uh, how I would put it. Because it's a collection of loosely uh, coupled components which are uh, choreographed, uh, uh, by some uh, uh, very uh, simple and elegant uh, uh, utilities and client uh, client glue, I would say. Uh, so basically, it contains Docker, 
Uh, actually, one more thing I would like to mention is uh, Kubernetes not only supports Docker, but it also supports Rocket uh, from uh, CoreOS. Anyway, uh, so this kind of Docker and it uses Mesos, uh, primarily Apache Mesos. Uh, it uses Kronos and Marathon, Marathon for running the jobs and Kronos for scheduling the jobs. It uses Sensu for monitoring and uh, it uses SmartStack against uh, DNS. There is a very good blog post on SmartStack. Why do you use SmartStack instead of DNS? Uh, SmartStack is also uses Zookeeper. Uh, SmartStack basically contains two components uh, called Nerve and Synapse, uh, where one of the component is basically a HA proxy running on each node, and uh, which uh, which provides discovery information based on whether the node, whether the health checks are running or not. Uh, then you have we have Jenkins and uh, we have Splunk and SigmaFX as well. Splunk is for logging uh, and SigmaFX is for metrics. Uh, next thing I just want, uh, uh, again, uh, this for the how the deployment works. I just want to go quickly over this, uh, how the deployment of you know, the Galera itself works with uh, Kubernetes. So you declare and build your nodes. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay. So you declare and build your nodes. Uh, basically, it's a Docker file. Uh, the aim is to keep your Docker file minimal and simple. It should be, as I said, uh, to keep, uh, it, sh it should not, ha it should not make any assumptions about the network or host name or anything, uh, because uh, having such assumptions binds uh, uh, binds those nodes and cannot be used in an environment such as this. If you if you declare a host name, let's say you declare a host name inside uh, the container, you cannot use it, uh, for instance, as an application controller because you cannot use it like a template and you know uh, spawn multiple nodes from the same thing. That's very important. Uh, I just want to mention that uh, before uh, Kubernetes, I was, uh, I mean, not before Kubernetes, but to run locally, I, I was using uh, Docker Compose. Uh, and uh, the, the issues I uh, had with Docker Compose was the same issues that I mentioned earlier when I was talking about services. It's that, uh, and this is without the new Docker style bridge networking, and Docker, lib network, without the lib network part. This is the old kind, old, old kind Docker networking, very now. Uh, uh, the discovery of the nodes, uh, uh, mutual nodes, happens through uh, updating of uh, EPC hosts and you know uh, the unidirectional linking from the older and newer containers. Uh, anyway, so th uh, the how the mapping is done? It's simple. Each Galera node run, runs in a pod, and uh, uh, optionally you can run like HA proxy or ZineAD or other things uh, alongside it in the same pod. Uh, HA proxy you can run if you want to run it inside a smart stack. That way, uh, it provides the discovery. Uh, one more thing I would like to mention here is that uh, uh, Kubernetes also provides a, a configuration to define health check, so that you know if a node is down. In, in general, how it works is when a, when your service dies, uh, the pod is tried. Uh, the service is respawned by the uh, kubelet itself. It runs on every node, and uh, and if the whole pod dies. Or uh, if the whole uh, node dies, then uh, replication controller ensures that uh, <coughs> the pods are spawned in a, on a, some other hardware node. You know, for instance, if there is a hardware failure, so that's how the respawning works on different levels. Here. Yeah, so the health check uh, API is also provided, so you can define your own uh, kind of health checks. Uh, and I believe it was recently added uh, to Kubernetes. It wasn't there a while back, and uh, that's also very useful. Uh, so that you can say that uh, it's not just when the service dies, and uh, but you can also say uh, in different ways on how it should be respawned. Anyway, so this, uh, how the deployment uh, works from this is I am uh, using the Google Compute Engine again as a template of uh, how I implement uh, Kubernetes. Well, you can set up your own Kubernetes, but uh, that is outside the scope of this talk, and there are only five minutes left. Okay, so you create like a flat network. Uh, this is very important for Kubernetes so that. Every pod gets its own uh, uh, unique IP address. This is very important to ensure uh, pod to pod communication as well. That is, every pod, irrespective of its physical locality, should be able to connect to uh, some, uh, any other pod, uh, uh, either through a direct IP address or through a service. Uh, then you create a cluster. This uh, cluster I quoted because it's not the cluster, of, uh, uh, the Lara cluster, but a cluster from Google Computing Engine perspective. Uh, that is the term uh, that they use. Uh, and then you create like a service endpoint. Uh, these are the endpoints you create for uh, internal uh, cluster to cluster, node to node communication in the cluster. 
or externals you use like 3306. So this is how the mapping is done, what I mean. You can map uh, 3307 or anything like internally to 3306. And you expose and you have the like, accession activities. Um, okay, then you bootstrap a node. Uh, bootstrapping a node, uh, basically, uh, and I believe this is a, a thorn in the shoe for most of the, uh, most of contemporary uh, distributed systems where you have to bootstrap a uh, node uh, uniquely and you know, it, they cannot bootstrap uh, each other. And uh, then you start rest of the nodes from template uh, and you point to a service, a Kubernetes service with a selector. That's what uh, is, I'll, I'll, I'll show that. I believe since we don't have much time. So this is how a service definition works, uh, if you can see. And uh, this is how the Docker file is. This is, as I said, I've kept it really simple. Uh, and uh, this is how the service uh, uh, looks. So you know you can defi you define your session, session activity and all that. Uh, yeah, this is how you define an external service. And uh, as I said, I put tell as a load balancer, so you can get load balancer get advantage as well. Uh, you don't need to use a separate load balancer if you are exposing uh, your cluster to a, an external client. And uh, this is how the pod definition looks, as you can see, uh, defined. Well, one thing that may stand up here is that I've not defined how the code should be mapped externally. That's not required because with Kubernetes as I said, every node gets a unique IP address. So uh, you don't need to map how the code is exposed externally. Uh, that is taken care of. That's not required at all. Anyway, uh, so this is how the command looks and all that. Uh, and uh, this is uh, how you can, oh, this is uh, the definition for a replication controller. And so you can easily scale it, you can give it like a number of rep replicas and you know it, it will create additional nodes. And if some of them die, it, it will spawn them again. Uh, this is how you use the labels here. So you can you know get the number of uh, uh, containers running for instance, or for stopping them. The concept of labels and selectors is very, very powerful and you know, and it's, it has been used not just in Kubernetes, I believe it's also used in uh, OS uh, system D uh, uh, services to attach uh, labels to them. Anyway, so that's it. Uh, uh, this is the credits. Uh, this is a further reading. Uh, this is not exhaustive at all, uh, but some any, anyway. Uh, this is my contact. That's it, I guess. Uh, for more, of course, as. Uh, Uh, yeah, you can ask questions, um, or as uh, he's going to tell you in some time, there's going to be a dinner and uh, I'll be there. Uh, but not necessarily sober, but distributed <laughs> systems are best, best discussed uh, when you are invited, right? Your answers are better when you are not sober. <laughs> I guess. I don't know. <laughs> it's you think the answer is better, Fred. <laughs> uh, yeah. So no question for you? I thought five years was over. Anyway, uh, thank you. Uh, I was wondering, <coughs> how do you manage to the, the, um, the copy of data when you are storing a new node? Right, right, right. Uh, uh, and that's a good question. Uh, and that's uh, that's very important as well. Uh, I think I believe that, you know, uh, and uh, this I would answer generically. Uh, well, in case of dire cluster, we have the, the node provisioning, which works, you know, uh, automatically because when a node joins, it contacts one of the, any of the nodes in the cluster, there's no concept of leader or follower, as you have in uh, HCD, for instance. Uh, all the nodes are symmetric, all the nodes are same, so it contacts one of the nodes, and uh, one of the node is chosen as the donor, uh, based on their state, and, you know, there, there's like a database state machine, uh, only the nodes which are synced can be selected as a donor, and, uh, and then it uh, transfers the data. There is a protocol for it, it's called snap, uh, Snapshot state transfer. Uh, it's kind of it's kind of like a tongue twister. Snapshot state transfer. Anyway, uh, so uh, we have that, and uh, that's how it works. And in case of something like Cassandra, it, it also I, I believe that's a, a requirement uh, to use uh, your service. I would say I wouldn't say requirement, but it's uh, it's better to have something similar to that. You know, Cassandra also has it. For instance, if when you add a new Cassandra node. Uh, you can, you know, transfer the data uh, and all that. Uh, and that's a requirement, uh, I would say it's uh, desirable, not a requirement, but it's quite desirable to have something something like that. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, but I was thinking about the DB and the Oscarized and Spanador because you need I know, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well,
well, as I said, uh, you can also have a separation of uh, controller and data plane, which is also possible with MySQL, but it's not, uh, uh, you know, uh, there uh, by default. You can, you can, of course, separate your data plane from your control plane.